Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. We're going to be continuing on in our series in the Gospel of John. So I'm going to ask you to turn with me to chapter 5. We're going to read verses 30 through 47 in the Bible in the pew. That's on page 890. So if you go to chapter 5 with me. And I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Join me in hearing what Holy Scripture has to say. Starting at verse 30. Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth, not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent." You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe? When you receive glory from one another, and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? It's the word of the Lord. Be seated as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this text. I thank you for the gospel of John, which moves us and drives us with such persuasiveness and power towards a person, towards the one whom was sent the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that through this text and the preaching of it, that he would be made known and that that would promote faith as we see him. I I pray that you would also use this text to stir us up, to correct us where we need correcting, and to allow us to see things plainly, even things about our own heart. So I pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would use this time to bear fruit in our hearts, some to belief and some to further trust, further confidence in the Savior that we love. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. When preparing for this text, I was reminded of the book Pilgrim's Progress. This book is familiar to many of us. It's a beloved book. Many copies are sold. And there are some kids, because we got three to five Uh, Grades 3 to 5 up here. Maybe you too have read Little Pilgrim's Big Progress. I think I'm saying that right. And in that book, there is a scene that takes place in a courtroom. Christian and faithful have made their way, and they're making their way to the celestial city. And between the celestial city and them is is Vanity Fair. And this vivid, the pictures almost come in your mind when you think about this if you've read the book. All of a sudden, they enter Vanity Fair... And there is a disruption in the city because Christian and faithful are preaching and they are not buying what the city 
has to offer. So this ends up with Christian and Faithful thrown in prison, and it ends up with them actually going to a courtroom before Lord Hategood. And what uh, follows is a trial. And Faithful really is the person under trial specifically. And listen to the words of the second witness brought up in this courtroom setting that will speak against Faithful. This is what he says, and I'm going to try to add a little dramatic flair to this. I have no great acquaintance with this man, nor do I desire to have any further knowledge of him. However, I know that he is a very troublesome fellow. By some conversation I had with him the other day in this town, for then while walking with him, I heard him say that our religion was nothing, and nothing by which man could please God in any way. By his meeting, Lord, hate good your lordship, you very well know what this will necessarily follow. That is to say that we still worship in vain, are still in our sins, and shall finally be condemned to hell. And this is all I have to say. That was the testimony of a man named Superstition. Faithful had to have uh, got the privilege of having a word from Lord Hate Good, final word. And this is what Faithful said in light of Superstition's testimony. And I want us to hear what he has to say. So I think it makes sense of our text today. As to the second man, Mr. Superstition, and his charge against me, I said only this, that in the worship of God, true faith is required. But there cannot be true faith without a divine revelation of the will of God. So whatever we bring into worship with God that is agreeable to... Div- uh, sorry. So whatever is thrust into worship of God that is not agreeable to divine revelation reveals only a faulty faith. That faith will not be profitable for eternal life. So in this courtroom, there was a buzz because the religion of Vanity Fair was under fire. We, too, have a courtroom setting in our text. If you... We're uh, reading along with me there. As you were, you can see the word witness, testimony. There's even the word accuser at the end of our text. Moses, who will accuse you. And in the town of Vanity Fair, similar to our text, there is an agitation as well. If you look back with me at verse 18 of chapter 5, it says, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. I don't think you can get more agitated than that. If you think you can, maybe let me know after the service. I think wanting to kill someone is as argumentative and spiteful as it gets. So one group was frustrated at the testimony of faithful. And while the positions are somewhat switched in our text, there is a group who has also laid down a verdict that they want to kill Jesus, and it's the religious leaders. It's the religious leaders. And they have placed this verdict down, just like Lord hate good and superstition and the rest in Vanity Fair placed the verdict down on Faithful, who was subsequently killed for his faith. You see, Jesus has made marvelous claims in John chapter 5. Claims that he is the unique and only son of the Father. Claims that he is one that has life in himself. He is the sent one that came to judge and give life. And there is an uproar. And you get the sense that when they hear those claims from the mouth of Jesus... Naturally, they're going to say things like this. Well, prove it to me. Prove it to me. And in some sense, that's not illogical. We would do that with most people. If they say, came and made crazy claims that they met with the Lord and I've got a revelation from him, we would naturally want to have that bolstered and backed up by Scripture and other evidence. So they are, in a sense, going to launch their complaint for proof. And in our text... A heavenly witness, a weighty witness, is going to speak about Jesus. It is going to bolster his claims. In our text, it says in verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. That word not true could be either valid, uh, is not valid. I think you could also say, as other commentators would say, it's, it's not sufficient. Jesus is saying, my testimony about myself adheres to, is amen, and is sufficiently seen in the broader witness of scripture 
my works and the Father. And in one sense, I think it's a marvel when we start to understand the Trinity that Jesus, it, his own testimony, he didn't need his testimony to be shown to be true or false. Jesus' testimony was true. These witnesses that will arrive to bear witness about the person and work of Jesus are for our good. You see, Jesus always speaks the words that the Father gave him. He always did the works that the Father gave him to do. That means at all times, there's a continuous affirmation of the Father about the Son. When the Son says, I am the unique Son of the Father, the Father amens it. Yes, you are the unique Son. And that is the beautiful working of the Trinity. But again, this text asks us, just like the response of faithful, talking about faulty faith, it, does my faith adhere to and in, is it in alignment with what God has clearly revealed? That's what faithful was saying. Whatever you bring into the worship of God, if it's not agreeable to his word and his character, what is shown will be faulty and faulty faith. And at the end of our text, in verse 46, it says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. And verse 45 says that there is one who will accuse you. So this is serious matters. It means that unlike Vanity Fair, who had the religion, but it was very worldly, there can also be a form of religiosity that looks more biblical. Kind of has a bit more of that uh, churchy uh, uh, veneer to it. And I think that just raises the earnestness of the text. So I want to ask us this morning, what is our faith rooted in? What is our approach to the Bible? And will our faith prove, to use the words of faithful, to be profitable? So the witnesses are going to come. Jesus, in a sense, is going to call in the witnesses into the testimony booth. And he's going to do that with four different witnesses to show that his claims about himself are true for us. So the first witness, I'm just going to go through in sequence. I'm not going to list them all right now. So witness number one, John testifies to Jesus as Savior, verses 33 through 35. And I say Savior because verse 30 links us back to the prior argument, verses 19 through 29. I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge. See, it's not just that Jesus' will is in perfect harmony with the Father's, it's that he is the sent one to accomplish things. He is the one who will judge, who will give life. He is the Messiah. So these witnesses testify, yes, he's the unique son of the Father, but he is the Savior. So John enters the box, John the Baptist. Look with me at verse 33. You sent to John, and he has borne witness about the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. See, Jesus, pointing us back to John the Baptist, really is a gift. It's a gift. See, John was a prophetic voice. The first in over 400 years. It had finally arrived. The, the last prophet. And the text says that he was a burning and shining lamp. And the text goes on to say, and this was not for me, it was for you. See, I think the gift of bringing us back to John the Baptist is that it helps us come face to face with the gospel again. You see, if you go back and read about John, John was clearly saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And his preaching, there, it created a bit of a, 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 a frenzy of enthusiasm. And Jesus is saying, you sent to John, and you were willing to bask in his light for a little while. And that's a sad statement. You were willing to bask in his light for a little while. And I wonder, what happened to these religious leaders that they would have went and then left? What did they hear? What, what made them irked? What made them want to retreat and not absorb the message of John? And you get the sense that they've walked up into these crowds and robe religiosity and they get to the front of the lawn and the front of the line and all of a sudden they hear John the Baptist say, repent. See, it's quite possible that these religious were, leaders were so thankful that a word from God had finally come to maybe stir up some other people. Maybe those who aren't as morally acceptable as us, ethically acceptable as us, 
maybe those who don't abide by the law as much as we do, but yet know they heard something about their heart. They were called to repentance. They were called to ponder their need to be saved and that a Savior was here. So they're listening. And as one commentator you get the, said, you get the sense that they're talking amongst themselves. They're like, nice guy, but a bit extreme. John the Baptist. Not really a guy I want to listen to anymore. I'm just going to pack up and leave. But Jesus brings this witness about to show that they rejected John the Baptist's Savior. John the Baptist was a voice. He was a signpost to another. And they did not receive whom John pointed to. And I, I marvel at verse 34. It says, not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. I marvel at the love of Christ. Even in this text where the witnesses will one day stand against these people and say, you were wrong. Jesus is saying there's still time. Consider afresh the Savior. And as I was thinking about that, it made me think how many people might be here just today and you haven't been at church for decades. You haven't read your Bible in a long time. I think it's a grace of God that you're here today. That you can come and, and be reconnected with the gospel. See, John was a preacher. Not come and see me, but come and see the one I point to. Come and see the Son. What a loving approach. And even, it just challenges me. Do I have the love of Jesus to take the gospel out to those who might seem to be the most opposed to Christianity? And yet Jesus holds it out. And I think for us to get to a place like that, we need to realize just how sinful we were. We rejected the, the gospel. How many times have you heard it before you put your faith in it? We needed to hear it again and again and again. So I pray that we would have this heart of Jesus. And I also pray that we, in a sense, would be a, like John the Baptist-esque, in the sense that we would be continually proclaiming. You see, when people leave, I think the tendency is to say, we, maybe we should change the message. Maybe we should alter the way we're doing things so we can get, get more people in. But yet that's opposed to what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, go back and hear John again. Go back and hear that one that faithfully proclaimed the Son. And it's challenging for us to have that heart and to be faithful in proclaiming the gospel. So John bring, Jesus brings us back to John to see that John clearly pointed towards a Savior and also to reveal that there's a love of Christ still. See, I don't know how many of these Pharisees got to the end of their life still holding on to their faulty faith and after they died, heard that verdict from Jesus. But let me tell you, it doesn't have to be that for you today. Come and hear. Come and hear the testimony of John. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So witness number one has spoken. And he testified to the Messiah. What about witness number two? Witness number two is Jesus' works testify that he is the Savior. In verse 36... So witness number two, Jesus works, testify that he is the Savior. Verse 36 reads, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father sent me. Now this makes sense to us because we're all, some of us, we're, we're good at stuff and we're not so good at other things. And, and how we do things bears witness about us. Like if I do something, it's going to somehow resemble my competence to do it or, you know, those types of things. So there's some of you in this room that are really good at home renovations. And you're, you get phone calls a lot <laughs> because you're really good at those things. There's probably, I can think of three or four. I'm praying for you guys. <laughs> it's a lot of work. But it, your work shows your skill in doing it. And our house... I'm known for throwing things out earlier than we should. I get, I get rid of things. There's probably things that waste-wise that you've seen that we needed that I threw out. <laughs> and that, that, that testifies about me. So when something's missing in our home and, and they say, oh, where's this? The first thing they do is ask me, Matt, have you seen X, Y, and Z? It's 
because that's characteristic of me. So tr- it is true that Jesus' works reveal him. And what do they reveal? That he's sent from the Father. So we should ask, what works? What are these, this greater testimony that come out of these works? Well, I think the Gospel of John gives us plenty. Maybe it was the work of telling a Samaritan woman all that she ever did. Maybe it was the work that was just most recently done, healing a lame man. Maybe it was healing the official son with just a word at a distance. Maybe it was the work that we're going to see come in John, where Jesus feeds 5,000 people, showing that he is the Messiah that can be the provision we need to satisfy our spiritual needs. Maybe it's the work of raising Lazarus from the dead. And there's no coincidence that Jesus says in, in times like that, I am the resurrection and the life. That work testifies to who he is. What a witness these works show. Death to life, lame to walk, blind to sight, the Son of Man has come. John, he's so excited about writing down these signs, he says in his book, there are many other signs that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples. And he says, I bear witness to the fact that these things are true and I'm writing them down. John 21, 24. Verse 25 says, there is also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one to be written down, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would need to be written. What a witness. That's a great witness. And the challenge for us is to examine them. Will you examine them? The religious leaders of that day said, no thanks. I'm going to do away with those works I'm going to do away with it so obviously right in front of my eyes. I pray we would not do that. For in the work show the significance of of the Messiah, who he is, and what he's come to do. Again, faithful said, whatever is thrust into worship of God that is not agreeable to divine revelation reveals only faulty faith. These works are the works that the Father gave the Son to do. See, these works command that the Father sent the Son and that Jesus is who he says he is. So by rejecting the works, you reject God himself. And this isn't something that's restricted to this time. Many people would want to remove the supernatural from the Bible. And what they do is they make themselves the arbiter of what is true. They say, I know what verses and texts in the Bible are original, They say, as far as my mind can conceive, these things can happen. They start to pick apart the Bible like it's any other human book. And that is to our detriment. That will be an accusation against us on the final day if we do not receive the Son. Because the works testify. Jesus is the unique Son of God. John 1, 1 through 3, says this. It says... Um, in chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things that were made through him, all things were made through him, and without him, not anything that was made that was made. In one sense, Jesus, as the creator, his wor- everything bears a witness to him. He made everything, made f- through him and for him. And yet, specifically, we're called to consider the Word, which shows the signs that Jesus did on earth. I think the greatest sign is still to come in John, and that is the cross. It's not coincidental that Jesus says on the cross, his last words recorded in the Gospel of John is, it is finished. What's finished? The works of the Messiah to save sinful people that would turn to him, to defeat sin and to defeat death. So let me be clear this morning, there's nothing wrong with the signs. And that will be the final word on the last day. There was nothing wrong with those signs. There was nothing wrong with John the Baptist. So again, what's wrong with the Pharisees? Why are they missing it? But he continues on and calls the third witness up to the stand. The third witness is God the Father testifies that Jesus is the Savior. Verse 37 and 38. Witness number three, God the Father testifies that Jesus is the Savior. 
37 through 38. So yes, these works, they testified of who Jesus was. The Father gave those works to the Son to do. But this verse is unique. For it says, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. See, it's interesting in, in, in two ways. One, it's kind of interesting that we actually don't know the way. Like, what, 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 is he, what is he talking about here? And what way is the Father born witness? But it's also interesting this is a personal witness that's public. God the Father bears witness about the Son. And I think that it would not, I, I think John is most likely thinking about the baptism of Jesus. All four Gospels include this. John includes the least amount of information about it. But if we go back and hear from Matthew 3.17, we hear something glorious. It says, And behold, a voice from heaven said, and this is after Jesus came out of the water, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. An audible voice from heaven by the Father saying, This, Jesus, of Nazareth is the beloved. He's my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Echoing what we've already heard in John, that he is the unique son from the father, the one that the father loves. And you can imagine that the Pharisees of that day were either at that baptism or they heard about it. Even Matthew 3.17 says, and behold. You got the sense of that? That would have been echoed all through the town. Oh my goodness, did you hear what happened today? We heard the voice of God. And that word would have got around to those Pharisees, and still they say, I'm not going to believe. They still are not going to say, Jesus might be the sent one that I need. See, something is wrong in the hearts of the Pharisees, and I think it's going to be exposed in the calling up of this last witness. Witness number four. Witness number four, the scriptures testify that Jesus is the Savior. The scriptures testify that Jesus is the Savior. And I, I think that the, the Pharisees and religious leaders would have been sufficiently irked and very mad that Jesus was both calling God his Father and that they did not know the Father because they were rejecting his works. You get the sense that the, the, the Pharisees say, okay, this is our moment. I've memorized Leviticus. I maybe I've memorized the whole Pentateuch and one steps forward and just wax poetics just starts to rhyme off the whole Pentateuch. And yet there's something here that they're missing. See, they had memorization. They could recite all those things. They had Bibles on Bibles on Bibles. They had the scriptures and yet they missed something. Verse 39. And you do not have his word abiding in you for you do not believe the one whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. This is, a, this is ridiculous. Th think about this with me. This would be like planning a trip to Europe to go to the Sistine Chapel. And you've got your brochure and you're reading it at home. And you're saying, okay, I'm going here. This is going to be marvelous. Michelangelo, architecture, art. It's going to be super. And you get on your plane and you get over there and you get in line. You wait for hours or however long it takes to get in there. And you're in the Sistine Chapel and you're still looking at your brochure. You're saying, oh, the Sistine Chapel, I've got it. It's right here in my brochure. It's absurd. You wouldn't be doing that. But that's what they were doing with the Bible. They're pouring over and they're saying, look, I've got it. I've got the scriptures. Meanwhile, the one who the scriptures pointed to is right in front of them. And they can't see it. How sad is that? They refuse to come to me, even when the scriptures bear witness about him. I love what Dick Lucas says. He says, theology that does not produce worship and adoration of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is not Christian theology. See, these men were religious guys. They had Bibles. They would have been the people that they, other people looked up to and said, if there's anyone that knows God, it's those guys. But really, the reality is, that you can have the Bible and not know God. Let me say that again. You can have the Bible and not know God. You can read and pour over it 
and find something else. It's so sad. How do you know that you have God? You have the Son. How do you know that you have God and that you truly know Him? You love Him. His Word abides in you, and you agree with the Son. So I think there's something here for us to ponder. It's, it's not about the intellect. These people that were going to sit under the weight of these witnesses had all the information, but they lacked humility. They lacked giving up pride and running to the Savior. So what this reveals is that we have a heart issue that needs dealt with, that we need humility. We need the Son. We don't need to read necessarily more. We don't need to, not necessarily about getting more information. We need the Son. And this text gives us striking statements. The first striking statement is that all the scriptures point to Jesus. Isn't that marvelous? Jesus is saying that's what they do. How much? All of it. It all points to me. Even Moses at the end, whom they set their hope. Moses testified of Jesus. I want us to think about how the gospel of John does this. Turn with me back to chapter 1. John the Baptist is ministering, he's proclaiming, and this is what he says. The religious leaders come to him and they say, they said to him in verse 22, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. See, when John the Baptist was ministering, Isaiah started to make sense. When the Messiah came into being, it came onto the scene, Isaiah is saying, that's him, through the ministry of John the Baptist. The Old Testament points to Jesus. Did you even catch in our text how John the Baptist is referenced? He is a burning and shining lamp. That's interesting. Why would they say lamp? Well, Psalm 132 says this, For Yahweh has chosen Zion. He has desired it to be his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. I will abundantly bless her provisions. And it goes on to say, say this, There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. See, when John the Baptist was on the scene, Psalm 132 makes sense. Psalm 132 comes into play. We might think even of chapter 2, when Jesus was ministering in the temple, and he, out of his zeal, he cleansed the temple. And it says in verse 17, or 16, it says, And he told those who sold pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And interestingly enough, it says his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. That's Psalm 69.9. Do you see how the Old Testament is giving clues to who Jesus is? It all points towards him. It all points towards his fulfillment of those scriptures. Even think of the great text that we all love, Isaiah 6, the glory of the Lord filling the temple. John 12, it says that Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. He's talking about Jesus See, when Jesus was on earth, Isaiah was coming into play. Isaiah 6 made sense. So they could say, they've searched in the scriptures, but the scriptures speak of Jesus. And John shows us that. Which means we should read the Bible as a story. A story of the Son. That means we start at the beginning and we read through, we see what it points to, the clues it gives, what it says about how the Savior will be, where he'll come from, what he'll do. And then when Jesus shows up, we can say, yes, there is the Messiah. We can read the Bible as a story. We can read it humbly because it's not about us. It's about the Son. So I wonder, does our Bible reading, as one author say, promote arrogance or does it promote boasting in the Son? When we read our Bibles, 
Are we getting to know the Lord so much so that we would never even think of boasting in ourselves? Or we would boast in Christ. And on the last day, it would be sad if the religious leaders got into the divine courtroom and they said, yes, but we got Moses. We got the scriptures. I even, for somehow, miraculously, I got my Bible with me right now. (laughs) And yet the witness would say, you're guilty, the Bible and the scriptures speak of me. That would be a sad realization. So let us ponder that. Is our faith rooted in the Son? Is our faith profitable? Does it adhere to what the Scriptures say about the Son? See, this text also shows us another striking statement, and that is that our hearts, it's that the hearts of the religious leaders are full of pride. How sad is it that these men, these religious leaders, had filled up their hearts with so much glory for self, they had no room to glory in the beloved Son of God. They were blinded. They were so worried about getting glory from one another, people that they would only come on their own name, and they gladly received them. And Jesus says, you, but you won't receive the glory that comes from the only God. How sad is that? This badge of arrogance was was promoted through their Bible reading. Let's not read the Bible wrongly. We should read, and to know we're reading it rightly, we're magnifying the Son, we're getting to know the Son, and we're going to put our faith in the Son. So the witnesses have been heard. And for those who want to remain with that faulty faith that in the Scriptures themselves, I have hope, Maybe it's in my law keeping. Maybe it's in the fact that I have a Bible, that I'm one day going to be saved. The resounding testimony from John 5 says, no, you will only be saved if you have the Son. And I wonder, again, what have we put our faith in today? And will it prove profitable on that day? What a grace of God to give us the end before it comes. He's moving us by his grace to see the witness. And what great encouragement we have that our faith, if we put our faith in Jesus, is the real thing. We can scan the scriptures and see Jesus. We can dig into John and see the significance of his works. And we could have our faith bolstered that we know the Father because we believed in the Son. I think that's great encouragement for us. And I pray that we would have our fixation on the Son and the Son alone. So let's press into our Bibles. I don't think John is saying, be lazy with your Bible. I just think he's saying, read your Bible rightly. And place your faith in what can truly save. The Scriptures that testify about the Son. The Father that testifies about the Son. And the John the Baptist who testifies about the Son. And the works of Jesus that testify about the Son. So the Pharisees who are willing to put their verdict out that Jesus, where they're getting ready to stone him, a heavenly verdict has been placed. Witnesses have been brought. And the Son of Man will be glorified on the last day, shown to be true, shown to be the Messiah. And I pray that that's true for us today, that we would see him and love him and seek him alone. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for this text. I pray that we would be people that have a real relationship with you through the Son, that we would not put that as the basis of our relationship or knowing you any other thing, that we would boast in Christ alone. And I pray that 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 would convict and encourage and promote faith in Jesus today. Amen.